In the last lecture, we discussed the formation and structure of proteins. In this lecture, we'll cover some of the basics of the analysis of proteins. If you have a solution of protein, it is often helpful to be able to quantify the amount of protein in the solution. This can be done by spectrophotometry. There are two basic types of spectrophotometry. Visible light spectrophotometry is the first kind that we'll talk about. It is done using a spectrophotometer like the one pictured here. Remember that we use this type of spectrophotometry in micro when we analyze the effectiveness of different types of antibiotics on the growth of bacteria. The basic principle behind it is that a solution with more protein will absorb more light than a solution with less protein. In order to quantify the amount of protein in a solution using this technique, we must first do a test known as the Bradford assay which is one of many types of color metric assays in which the solution changes color based on the amount of protein it contains. In order to do this, you add a measured amount of a solution known as Kumasi Blue to a measured amount of your protein solution. Kumasi Blue is brown when no protein is present, and it turns blue in the presence of protein. As you can see in the photo on the left here, the solution in the leftmost cuvette has no protein, while the one on the right has the highest protein concentration. Visible light spectrophotometry doesn't directly measure the protein concentration of a solution. It indirectly measures it by measuring the absorbance of the blue dye, which absorbs light at a wavelength of 595 nanometers. There are some advantages and disadvantages to this type of spectrophotometry. Its one real advantage is that it is relatively inexpensive, as compared with the UV light spec we'll discuss in a minute. There are a number of disadvantages, however. You need to use up some of your sample in order to perform this type of spectrophotometry, as you have to add Kumasi Blue in order to analyze it, and you cannot regain the original once you have done this. The analysis is more time-consuming, as you have to wait for the reagent to react with the sample and change color. There are limits on the sensitivity of this technique, as the Kumasi Blue may turn incredibly similar colors when mixed with solutions of slightly different concentrations. UV light spectrophotometry is the second way to measure the protein concentration of a solution, and is usually the preferred method if there is a choice between the two. In order to perform this type of spectrophotometry, a UV spec is needed. It works based on the principle that the ring structures of phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan absorb UV light at wavelengths of 260 and 280 nanometers. Because we assume that the proportion of these aromatic amino acids is roughly proportional to the amount of protein in the solution, this technique works. Unlike a visible light spectrophotometer, a UV light spec directly measures the concentration of protein in a solution. However, this process has its advantages and disadvantages as well. It is more accurate than visible light spectrophotometry in that it is more sensitive. It doesn't require that you destroy your samples as you don't have to add any kind of reagent to them. It doesn't require that you have any other reagents in order to perform the assay, so it is easier and faster. However, it can be impacted by the composition of protein in that the proteins don't all contain the exact same percentage of the aromatic amino acids. Therefore, a more concentrated solution that has fewer of these amino acids could appear to have a lower concentration than a solution that is actually less concentrated but has more of the aromatic amino acids. The second disadvantage is that a UV spec is significantly more expensive than a visible light spec, so many labs may not have one. While it is often helpful to determine the total concentration of protein in a solution, we rarely get a protein in isolation. Rather, we usually have a mixture containing many different proteins. Therefore, knowing how to separate proteins is important so that we can analyze a specific protein of interest that is present in a mixture. The separation of proteins can be done in a few ways, the first of which we will discuss being separation based on solubility. We can selectively precipitate proteins from a solution by making them insoluble. 
As you can see here, the small ovals represent proteins that are dissolved in water. Solubility occurs because the interactions between the water molecules and the proteins are stronger than the interactions between the water molecules themselves. Therefore, the water molecules surround the proteins, making them soluble. However, adding ammonium sulfate, a salt, to the mixture makes the proteins clump together and become insoluble. This is because the interactions of the water with the salt are stronger than the interactions of the water with the proteins. As a result, the salt effectively pulls the water away from the proteins, leaving the proteins to cluster together and precipitate out of the solution. In order to perform a salting out procedure, you need to add salt to a solution containing a protein of interest. When you can see that the protein has precipitated out of the solution, centrifuge the mixture, pour off the supernatant, and collect the protein. Imagine that your mixture contained a few different proteins, all of which had different solubilities. You could precipitate them out one at a time by gradually changing the salt concentration of the solution. In addition to separating proteins based on solubility, they can also be separated based on charge in a very similar way as we saw with amino acids. Ion exchange chromatography can be performed with the same principles as we have already talked about. You select either a cation or an anion exchange column. The example here shows an anion exchange column, which we can tell because the positively charged beads will hold on to anions. A mixture of proteins is run through the column and fractions are collected. The proteins with a more positive charge will elute first, and those with a more negative charge will elute last. Size is another factor that can be used to separate proteins. This is done through SDS PAGE, which stands for Sodium Dodecyl Sulfate Polyacrylamide Gel Electrophoresis. Essentially, proteins are run through a gel, which acts like a sieve, allowing the small proteins to travel through faster, while the larger ones take longer. The first step in this process is to treat all the proteins with sodium dodecyl sulfate, which denatures them to their primary structures and coats the outsides with negative charges. This gives all proteins roughly the same charge to mass ratio, so that separation will be based on size. The protein samples are then loaded into the wells of a polyacrylamide gel and a current is applied. Because all the proteins start out negatively charged, they will all travel down the gel from the negative end to the positive end, separating based on their sizes. After the gel is stained, it will look like the picture on the bottom left, with each band representing a different protein. This technique is analytical rather than preparative as only about 20 microliters of a protein sample can be held in the well of a gel. Another way to separate proteins based on size is by a technique known as size exclusion chromatography. This method involves a size exclusion column which contains resin beads that are like tiny wiffle balls. The sample of proteins is loaded onto the column. Buffer is applied and the proteins run through the column with the larger ones traveling faster because they are excluded from the beads and the smaller ones traveling more slowly because they have to go through all the beads. The sample separates like is shown in the photo on the bottom right. Fractions are collected as they elute off the column and then are analyzed for the presence of protein.